Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody is enjoying so far the meeting. I, we're hearing a lot of great feedback, and this session is a potpourri. A lot of uh, great topics, and I think it's going to be very interesting, and a lot of learning points, and we don't have a lot of time. There's not a lot of building the discussion, so let's take advantage, and we'll try to make it fun, and we have the panel here, so we'll make the most out of it. Yes. Um, let me ask Dr. Banerjee if he wants to say a word. I just want to, uh, you know, talk about the rationale behind such a session. I think many of us have discussed earlier that everyone who attends peripheral talks does not have to do advanced CLTI interventions. But I think knowledge of the aortic arch, how to deal with horizontal arch, aortic dissections, carotid filter placements, access sites are really important for structural and coronary interventionalists. I think that will advance the scope of peripheral interventionalists and make those procedures safer uh, and more meaningful. So, Mehdi, uh, you're going to announce the first speaker. Absolutely. And I just want to ask our speakers, if you could please, our speakers, if you could please make sure you stay within the time limit. There's a timer on the back screen uh, so that we can try to build in some discussion. The first presenter is Dr. Giuseppe Tarantini, and he's going to be uh, discussing tackling horizontal arch during TAVR. Okay, thank you for having me. I have to start my presentation um, asking for, you know, for some apology of me because actually I didn't get that it was case-based, so I meant to present something that is mainly based on horizontal aorta and tower, but actually forgive me for that. So actually this is my disclosure and this is my storyboard, it's going to be a short talk. Problem definition, horizontal aorta, valve choice and available data, and clinical case, so very short cases. So problem definition, what is horizontal aorta <clears throat> in the TAVR setting? So actually, by convention, we use this definition. That is the angle between the, the horizontal angle and the annular plane. When this angle is 48 degree or more, actually we talk about horizontal aorta. So actually, this why the in literature, we have this angle, 48 degrees, because this is the mean value of a, a TAVI treated population. So this is the reason why we have 48. So actually, even though this is not a medium value, it's just a mean, actually in 44% of, for instance, US core valve clinical trials, you can find this, this finding of horizontal aorta. And this is important that the major predictors of horizontal aorta were older age, greater BMI, and this is interesting, less PAD, and uh, poor aortic calcification. This is interesting because it's counterintuitive, but we will see why it's going to be like that. <clears throat> Another thing that is important, and we discussed this point in a previous section, session or structure heart disease, bicuspidity and an angle that is higher than 70 degrees was an exclusion criteria in all these trials. So actually, when we talk about horizontal aorta, we do not discuss about extreme horizontal aorta. So valve choice and available data. Let's give a look at the evidence. So let's get started with the old generation device. This is a single center, 582 patients with a mix of different type of THV, core valve family or sapient family. And actually when you group the, yes, the population in two groups, that is uh, the angle horizontal aorta versus non-horizontal aorta, actually you can find a significant interplay between the horizontal aorta and the type of prosthesis. That is, that actually the device success and the PVL is worse when you go with self-expandable valve, but we're talking about the previous generation. This was not consistent with the result of curved valve US trials that failed to find this kind of interaction. And finally, there is a small study of 50 patients where you can see that uh, you know, the analysis is a little bit different. They looked at the patients with more than moderate aortic regurgitation. And what the author found is that there is a significant interaction with the angle between the ventricle and the aorta. So the more is horizontal, the higher is the rate of residual moderate aortic regurgitation. But let's go to <clears throat> more recent papers single center, 550 patients, including both first and second generation devices. And actually here you can see that the author failed to find 
an interaction between the device type and the device success for both Edwards, uh, Sabian, or Corval family. But, and this is strange again, there is an increase in pacemaker rate with a balloon expandable valve. Now, looking at the last registry, that is the Horse International Multicenter Registry, this is interesting that you can see that we have 2,000 patients per the two sub-studies. One is with the Cornwall family and the other one with the accurate. And actually, here you can see again the interplay between the horizontal aorta and the Cornwall family in terms of device success PVL and pacemaker that were higher for horizontal aorta compared to non-horizontal aorta. This was not true for the accurate NEO, but I think it's important, even though this is not an head-to-head -head comparison, to make some consideration about you know, the control arm event rate, because when we went for non-horizontal aorta, here you can see that the PVL rate is higher compared to the one of a core valve <coughs> in the accurate NEO, even though we don't have differences for this type of valve between horizontal and non-horizontal aorta. And another finding is the pacemaker rate that is lower than the one of core valve, and this is regardless of horizontal aorta or not. So going to the clinical case that probably is the focus of this session, and uh, I would like to share a few Cases, uh, I don't know why it do not studies any technician that can help me out. Can you play the video, please, in the back? Okay, like that. Actually, sometimes when you have an horizontal aorta, you have situation like this. We have seen in other previous session, and sometimes it's very difficult to tackle this kind of snake in the in the aorta. So you have to move carefully to change with the knob of the commander the direction to go into. Uh, the, um, the annulus, and actually at this point, by minor commander, you can be very coaxial and to avoid parallaxis, and this is the final result that is not too bad at all. So in my experience, not all the valve are the same when you tackle a aorta like that, because you have stiffer valve, like the core valve family is very stiff, and actually with the Navitor is a little softer because you don't have any spine within the delivery. Actually, this uh, Sabian family facilitates this trackability. This is another case <clears throat> of accurate NEOL. We went with pre-dilatation, then we go with the implantation of the valve. Here you have, you know, let's, let's say a kind of facilitating mechanism because you open up first the stabilization arch just to change a little bit the parallaxis, and then you go with the final implantation, post-dilatation, this is the final result. It is not too bad, so there are some tricks to follow when you, depending on the valve that you use. Finally, <clears throat> Few thoughts related to the core valve system, especially when you go with the 34. We have seen at least two cases in the previous session related to this point. This is a 34 valve. As you can see, it's very stiff. And when you have extreme horizontal aorta, sometimes it's very, very difficult. Let's say sometimes impossible to get through the valve. So you need to go with some tricks. One trick is to go with a balloon to inflate a small balloon. It might be 10 millimeter or so. You inflate the balloon just to permit, you know, to pop down with the valve. And it's going to be easier than to go with snaring. It, it's really, really more complex. And actually, you can finish up. You have the parallaxis, as usual with this valve when you have horizontal aorta. And this is the final result. It is not perfect because actually the 34 valve is not completely stable, you know, in this kind of situation. So last, my last slide is the following. When you have extreme uh, horizontal aorta, let's say a, a, an angle of 80, 82, or more than 70 degree, you may face this situation. I think it's important you to know in the real life. You deliver the valve, and actually here you can see that the valve is almost delivered, but still the pressure is dumped. So at that point, why it happens? So it will happen to you. And this is related to the fact that when you create the kinking of the valve, actually you don't have you know, the room to permit to the leaflets to work. So you have only two things to do in this case. The first try is to pull the valve, to strut it up and to permit the leaflets to start working. Or even better is to deliver very promptly the valve at this stage. Otherwise, the patient will go in cardiogenic shock. So this is the final result. So in conclusion, this is my conclusion. Horizontal aorta is a common finding. So actually, 
this is, there is not a class effect among the different THV. So for me, so the Sabian is more flexible and permit a low rates of PVL. When you go with the core valve family, especially you need, to, you need to go with this valve when you have a very large annually. And finally, the actual neon is, may facilitate your life sometimes because you have the stabilization arch and you have a low pace mega rate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, Giuseppe, hang in there for one minute. I, I think this is a great case. I want to ask a question. When the arch is really hostile and horizontal and you're having some challenges delivering either in the descending or along the aortic arch, have you ever tried to pre-place a snare? To, to pre what? To pre-place a snare and no. to be able to pull uh, and, and remove that bias out from the outer surface of the, of the aorta. I think sometimes, I mean, it's not a very common thing to do, but it can be easily instituted if thought in advance because you have to pre-place the snare. Bob? Colin Barker and the guys at Vanderbilt do that sometime. Um, my question for you is, do you, do you have a preferable wire when you, use, when you work yeah. horizontally? Do you like a stiffer or a less stiff wire to bias or not bias you? Uh, this is a, an important point. But actually, I don't like to use the lander quiz, to be honest, because um, when you have a, a, you know, a great tortuosity with calcification, sometimes you complicate your life because you need to have some kind of movement. Uh, you need you need to play with the wire and to detach a little bit the wire from the art, and you cannot do that with a lander quiz. So I don't like to change the wire. For me, when I see this kind of tortuosity, I prefer to select the most appropriate system. So for me, it's not, let's say, uh, I would go, you know, whatever it is with each valve is the same. For me, it's not the same. So for me, when I have a great tortuosity, a great angle, I won't go with a stiff, the uh, stiff, uh, you know, valve systems. I prefer to go, for instance, with the Sabian that permits you to to rotate the knob, etc., or with the Navitor. It is very slippery because it's hydrophilic compared to the other systems. So this is my experience. It almost looked like you had a J wire with a small J in, yeah. and none of the pre-shaped wires that yeah. we usually use. So that's why I was asking. Yes, agree. Quick question, even for the non-structural operators in the room. In we're all going to get used to doing coronary interventions in these patients after their TAVR valve has been done in the future. For these kind of horizontal routes, any recommendations for guide access in this situation in particular? Uh, you mean that when you have these horizontal aorta? Yeah. With, so, so these post-TAVR patients, right? We've talked about Amplatz guide with guideliner extensions and typical post-TAVR anatomy. Is that still going to be the same approach if, if that patient needs an LAD intervention in the future? Actually, uh, I don't have a definite answer. To That's fair. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so uh, with that, we're going to move to the next presentation by Dr. Robert Stoller. Uh, he's going to be discussing cerebral protection during TAVR. Thank you. Okay, not a very controversial topic. Go ahead. Let's see. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, so here's the case. 73-year-old diabetic, hypertensive, um, with severe aortic stenosis, a type 1 bicuspid valve. Um, it had gotten markedly more severe um, in the last six months with a mean gradient that went from 40 to 61 and a drop in DVI. He's a bovine arch, and he's mildly symptomatic. Here's just to give you an idea of the valve that we're dealing with, pretty clear type 1, um, right-left fusion. Here is his arch, bovine arch, fits for cerebral protection if we want. And here's the clinical challenge. Open versus transcatheter valve, that's a two-hour discussion on another day. Um, sentinel versus no cerebral protection. And if you decide you're going to put in cerebral protection, what's the best way to do it in a bovine arch? Um, so here's Protect Taver. Um, 3,000 patients randomized, half to sentinel, half not. The results, um, all stroke, no different, disabling stroke, slightly different with a number needed to treat of 125 patients. Um, the mechanisms of stroke in uh, the disabling were ischemic, so they're presumably embolic. <laughs> and um, here's some of the, the ancillary thoughts on protected TAVR. Subjects were not necessarily consecutively enrolled, so some sites might not have enrolled their nasty TAV and SAV or their most calcified bicuspids. Um, no case, no subset showed benefit. So if you're going to use it, you may as well use it in all cases. 
Um, generally, from the advisory boards I've been to, Protected Tavern did not change most my operators' mindset about using distal pro uh, cerebral protection. Um, cost of the device and profitability of your center matters, and that's going to matter with your uh, administration. And right now, I'm feeling like since we're about 250 cases a year, we have the potential to avoid two disabling strokes, but I'm waiting for the British, the BHF Protect Tavi trial, which is going to be about 7,700 consecutive patients treated. So how do I, how do I deal with my uh, um, sentinel use? Um, this is how I work when I work with it. Um, I always set a timer. I don't take forever to deploy it. I set my timer at 10 minutes, and if I can't get it in in 10 minutes or so, I stop. Um, most cases, I don't use the arch angiogram anymore. I just use the CT. That's all you need. Um, right radial access, 0.014 wire. If you feel like there's a radial loop or you have any difficulty getting from your radial access into the aorta, I don't push it. Um, most cases, if you put the, the 014 wire in the ascending or descending, it doesn't matter. But in a bovine arch, it helps you a lot to work to get the wire into the ascending. Um, and here's how it works. I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, I deploy the first basket, the innominate basket, low in the regular arch, high in the bovine arch. Pull the wire back into the device. And what I do is, for those of you that have seen the device, I pull the handles apart and torque at the same time. And it gives you a nice, smooth motion, which often will bring the device up pointing directly at the carotid, which is what you want. And what you have to kind of think about is separating the handles works on the y-axis. That's up and down. Torquing the device, curving the tip, works on the x-axis, side by side. So here's uh, um, the wire into the ascending aorta. You can see I've got my pigtail back so it doesn't get in the way. We're going to deploy that first basket, and I'm going to pull it up high. And this is the key for us to when you have difficulty wiring a bovine arch. The usual curve for the sentinel, you know, is shaped like a backwards J, right? So that you're pointing at the carotid that way. But if you have a bovine arch, sometimes it works incredibly well to retroflex the J as much as you can and use the back of the catheter to flip it around backwards. So this is essentially backward of how you usually use it, but as you can see, you're pointing right at the carotid in the bovine. And when you do that, you can slide your wire right up the carotid. Once you get your wire placed in the carotid, then you have to flip the catheter back around the opposite way. And this isn't the greatest picture, but you can tell we're, we're reversing that retroflex to get it oriented the way we usually like it. Then you pull the handles apart, which tightens the device back up into the carotid, gets it out of the way of your main pathway uh, in the aorta. Tighten it up, then drop your... Uh, uh, drop your left carotid basket into place. Once you've done that, you can take your pigtail and move it back and forth to make sure that you're in a, a position with your sentinel that will allow your TAVR device to get through. And if you have to, you can pull the whole device back slightly through the radial sheath, and that tucks you up into the, uh, uh, into the carotid and into the innominate. Next phase is you go through, and in this one we dropped a, a, a 29S3 in, and looks good as gold. So another case done by one of my younger guys, another bovine arch, pretty clear here. You can see he's going to drop the sentinel down. It comes over a curve, down into the ascending. Then he deploys this basket, and you can see he's retroflexed the, uh, uh, the tip of the catheter around, so it's opposite of how you usually orient it to get into the carotid. 
And you can see from there, you can slip a wire right up the carotid with the whole device sort of retroflex or twi twisted backward. After he does that, he's going to straighten, uh, straighten the J back out to its normal orientation, pull it back a little bit so it tucks itself up into the, uh, uh, up into the carotid. From there, he can deploy his basket, pull the whole device back a little bit. And from there, he's got plenty of room to get his tabber equipment around the bend, not have any trouble. So really, my sort of key learnings for this is use the catheter to aim into the left carotid. You don't you usually can't wire it straight up. It's not a PCI or a PTA case. Use your catheter to aim. Um, you're going to have to use the handles and the torquer, and moving them together um, often really helps you uh, uh, deploy in the right spot. Probe with the wire to get into the carotid. Push the second basket in. Pull the wire back. Don't leave it up too high so you don't tickle the brain. Um, pull the whole device up so it tightens up so you have room to use your taver and see if the pigtail passes under that. For a bovine arch, high deployment of the first basket helps you. And then there's sort of three ways you can go. You can use a tight curl on the distal device and try to pull the whole tight J up into the anominate um, and direct it at the carotid and then slip your wire in. Sometimes you can wire the left carotid directly if you're skillful or lucky enough. Um, and often what we do is reverse the curve on the distal device so that you can get coaxial to drop the wire in and then reverse that that curve so that you can put the uh, carotid filter in. That's what I have for you. Um, thank you for inviting thank me. Thank you very much, speak. Dr. Stoller. That. that was fantastic. And I don't know any questions from the panel. We can ask one question. We are running way behind sure. as usual. So, uh, any questions from the panel or from the audience? Bob, that was a great talk. I want to ask you a couple of questions. So, you know, we do not use uh, cerebral protection, as you suggested. It's sort of an all or none phenomenon, right? At this point, without any subgroups that benefit, we'd all like to believe that we can define the patient in advance who's going to benefit from this, but we just can't, right? So, if you're in an all or none world and you decide all, what are the, what are the, what's the calculus in your institution that made it happen, right? Because there's time issues, there's cost issues, and then there's efficacy questions. What, what, what was the calculus that led you to that decision? So we started in uh, Protected Taver. So we got sort of in the cadence of, of putting the Sentinel in most of our cases. We have fellow scrub with us, and we feel like it's good for them to learn how to do it. Um, from a profitability standpoint, we are a profitable Taver center, so we can afford to accept the cost of it. Um, and from an efficacy standpoint, I think there's still enough question pending the British study for us to continue to put it in until I think we get a definitive answer. As, as one of the sites that was enrolling in Protected Taver, um, I know from the discussions with, with the other sites and the other operators that there were a lot of what operators considered to be the highest risk cases that they kept out. And if, if it was a consecutive enrollment trial with these results, I probably wouldn't be using it, quite frankly. But with a 7,500 number trial coming, I'm going to let that be my, my deciding point. Those are great. That's, great. That is the, the, the question with Sentinel, I think. Great. Thank you so much. I think for the sake of time, I'm sorry, John, if that's okay with you, we move on. Uh, we're a little bit behind here. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, Dr. Lopez, who's going to be uh, presenting a case uh, around aortic dissection during PCI. Okay, well, I'm John Lopez from uh, Loyola University, and um, thank you to the organizers for having me here to discuss this uh, case. And this case isn't specifically about PCI, but it's about aortic dissection during coronary intervention, and I think it's relevant and applicable to all of us coronary interventionalists are either doing structural cases or even any large bore access cases, which is most of us in this day and age. So here are my disclosures, and uh, we'll move on here. So this is a 75-year-old woman who uh, presented for a TAVR requiring large bore access. She had the typical complicated uh, CB history, was, had a history of coronary disease with an intervention about two months prior to this admission, had uh, 
atrial fibrillation was on anticoagulation, heart failure reduced ejection fraction 35 to 40 percent or so, was diabetic, and had severe aortic stenosis, symptomatic with a mean grade of about 50, a valve area of 0.5, no question that uh, she needed to have her valve replaced, and had the standard pre or CT, which showed that she had moderately calcified iliac and distal aorta, but nothing that was really outrageous from uh, the standard views here, right? Some calcification distal aorta into the iliacs, but uh, a fairly straight shot, right? What typically shouldn't have been a difficult to access uh, case, right? Famous last words. So um, the challenge here is recognizing, really, is the first step, and then treating iatrogenic aortoiliac dissections, how we do it, and what's involved in that. So uh, this picture tells you a lot, and nothing good about this. this. is sort of the picture you see when you, when you get immediately sick to your stomach, right? So we had bilateral femoral access, and during the attempt to place the 14 French sheath, uh, difficulties encountered, and on fluoroscopy, what you saw, and this all happens in a heartbeat, right? You see the wire come back. Um, you see the uh, operator relatively inexperienced operator pushing the sheath forward while the wire is actively coming back because of the resistance at the groin. And very quickly you see that there's angiographic evidence of a very significant common iliac artery dissection, which almost immediately we felt was extending probably into the distal aorta, right, with that wire position lost. And there was angiographic evidence of extravasation at this point. So the question is, what do you do at this point? And other than take a deep breath for a second and, and try and be the, the calmest person in the room, uh, you do sort of the things you've learned about since day one, right? There are ABCs to start with. So we knew initially, right away, this patient started to have some pain, started to become hypotensive and was uncomfortable, that we needed to protect her airway. So she went from conscious sedation to being intubated uh, immediately with our anesthesiologist taking the lead on that very quickly. Uh, we focused then on some hemodynamic stability. She was placed on some pressors, support her very quickly, and then we ordered up some blood. We knew that they were in for a little bit of a, an effort in this situation, right? At that point, uh, if you look on the left here, we can see that there's pretty extensive dissection in the common iliac on the right that extends up to the aortic bifurcation. Now, the good news in this situation is that we're at that point in our TAVR procedure where we had seven French access on the left side, which we, for uh, planning purposes, upsized to an eight French sheath and crossed over very quickly. And before we did anything else, we were able to bring a wire over, snare that wire with our uh, tulip snare, bring it into this 14 French uh, sheath and very simply and quickly bring over a covered BBX stent, 8 by 59 stent, parking it at the entry site to that dissection and extending up to what we thought was right at the origin of the uh, common iliac artery. So she got better very quickly. Uh, there's some angiographic improvement. There was some hemodynamic improvement, but we were pretty clear that we weren't out of the woods at this point yet, right? Uh, and the reason we weren't out of the woods is when we sort of next did an aortogram, we could see that there was still some extravasation in the very distal part of the aorta, right? Right up here, where our stent ends, right about here, right? So, and this is sort of where your planning and your teammates and your uh, institutional experience is helpful. At this point, we had done what we could to temporize the situation, and this is sort of the extent and essentially the limits of, of my expertise in this situation, but we were fortunate enough to have one of our really very uh, experienced and spectacular vascular surgeons with endovascular experience come by. And for, the, for him, this was really not a tremendously complicated situation, right? We had set the table for him pretty well, right? We had a very large bore sheath in the right side. We had an eight French sheath on the left side. He took an aortogram and very quickly, uh, put up two 035 wires in the right and left side to the distal aorta, put in a gore uh, aortic graft, followed by VBX stents to both the distal aorta on the right and the left, kissing balloon technique, what they call the CRAB technique to reconstruct the aortic bifurcation, 
and for good measure put a very short uh, VBX cover stent at the distal end of that right common iliac dissection to ensure that we sealed it off. So within an, about an hour or so, we had the image on the right from the start of this case to this point in time, and we were able to leave the lab with this patient uh, having gotten one or two units of blood off pressors and hemodynamically stable. So at this point, uh, you know, our steps were to say, well, what do we do next, right? So clearly we weren't gonna do the TAVR on this day, uh, but we did take her the next morning for a CT scan, really for really baseline follow-up, right? To give us something to measure for the next few weeks to decide uh, how she was recovering. Expectedly, she had some degree of blood in her uh, peritoneal cavity, but uh, no evidence of extravasation, was really quite stable, went home, uh, a day and a half, two days later, and came back and had her taver uh, four weeks later, and has done very, very well. So we were lucky, we were uh, planned, we sort of knew what to do in the situation, and we had good colleagues who helped us out. So what are the points here that are worth taking home? So distal aortic dissection with large bore access is something hopefully you'll never see, but you need to be prepared for it. If you're doing structural work, if you're doing large bore access for hemodynamic support, and that requires preparation, right? It also requires comfort with tools uh, for bailout, covered stents and their sizing. It requires collaboration, having a team that can help you when you get into a jam, and thinking about what kind of imaging you want for follow-up. So this kind of distal aortic dissection is an important thing to work through. It's very different than sort of what we typically see during PCI where ascending aortic dissections, which are also quite rare, and typically can either be managed conservatively or sometimes treated with a coronary stent, but this is a very, very different animal that requires a whole different skill set, right? And that skill set and toolbox should include things like sheaths that you're comfortable crossing over with, a series of snares in your lab for this kind of emergency, covered stents of various manufacturers, but in the range of six to 10 millimeters to deal both with your iliac arteries. And um, the ability to have an aortic balloon nearby in case of some aortic rupture or extravasation, and in tools that you or your vascular surgeon can use to, to get you out of a jam in this situation. So I'm gonna stop there and, and uh, we'll take some questions, I guess. Thank you, John. Uh, I think both cases demonstrate that we can minimize multiple manipulations of carotids during sentinel replacement uh, with some simple and now through experience learning tips and tricks out of storage shed. And, and John's case is, I think, quite evident, is that right? I mean, most of our fellows in training are doing more radial access. They are doing fewer femoral access, but when they are doing it, it generally involves a sicker patient and or large bore. I think, but I, I think that, uh, Bob, go ahead. I I think your case is a perfect example in 2023 when there are 16 TAVR uh, uh, sites in DFW that there's a certain skill set that the TAVR operator has to have, even non-heavy volume peripheral operators. There has to be a team in play that can come help you when you need it, particularly the vascular surgical guys. And you have to know how to get yourself out of trouble and sometimes I, I wonder at a smaller shop that's doing um, less risky cases than what you guys are usually you're used to tackling, if this case would have done nearly as well, not having someone with your expertise and your team on board to take care of it. So I think this is a really good, important, demonstrative case of what you need for the occasional time that something really bad does happen. Uh, Peter and... Uh, uh Sukas and Peter Monteleone, so Peter won't work. Uh, so any, you know, there are so many different ways this, uh, this can, happens and can be dealt with. Uh, tell us about uh, dilation. What is your go-to? Do you, do you just off the bat try IVL for calcified iliacs, or you try to dilate with sequential dilations and then try IVL? And Peter Monteleone can speak about are there situations where you want to place a stent and dilate within a stent? So, brief comments. 
Um, great cases speaks to the, the value of multidisciplinary care. You know, more and more we've been talking about the upfront considerations before some of these complex situations. Taver teams, multidisciplinary teams do better jobs than most of, of having pre-procedural information. You know, we, we try to review a lot of these CTAs um, for the heavily calcified work uh, in advance. And um, uh, more and more cases, we're now doing pre-treatment with IVL this way. Uh, you're able to kind of pass devices relatively safely through calcified lesions and also not have a stent in place as you're pushing the large devices through. So oftentimes it's it's IVL, TAVR, angiogram posts decide if you need to leave stent behind at the end of the procedure. Um, you know, Peter, with your expertise, one of the questions I would ask is, would you ever endograft these or, or would you do Cerebr kind of covered stenting uh, if you had both skill sets? Because I know if I got called into this room, I would, I would do what they did. You know, I would do a distal aortic covered stent and then VBX is into it. Would that be your approach? Yeah, I think for the majority of cases, I think for the majority of cases, you can do exactly what they did here, CRAB. You know, John had made the point in the, in the earlier session that it's very, very rare that uh, you'd still have a leak. I mean, you could theoretically have a, still have a little bit of a gutter leak, but, you know, he made the point that it's very rare that if you have a covered stent in the aorta and then you're putting covered stents in each iliac limb, it's very unlikely that you're not going to have a seal. Okay, and that's quick and easy, and that stuff is immediately available in the cath lab. Um, now, there, if, if you're at a hospital that, you know, you're in a cath lab, you're not in the OR, you might not necessarily have an AFX graft, or you might not have an EVAR cuff that you can just, you know, run into the room next door and have. So if you don't have that stuff immediately available, then of course it makes sense to do VBX in the aorta first, then kiss into that first aortic stent, you know, the so-called top hat and trousers. But for the structural cases, I mean, these people all have CTAs ahead of time. So the advantage of being, of, of having that is you already know how bad the calcium is and you know what size vessels they are. So when, uh, when the pressure drops and you're dealing with the crisis situation, you should already know what size um, covered stent that you need. And so you can just move very, very quickly to just putting in a device that's appropriately sized. Um, I don't think there's any uh, uh, disagreement or any controversy of the fact that IVL has really become and should be part and parcel of anybody who's got um, iliac disease who needs a large bore axis. There's absolutely no reason, especially now that the L6 balloons are available, there's no reason why you can't get a terrific result and not have to use dilators. I mean, you can just put an 018 wire up into the aorta. You can take a nine or a 10 or even a 12 millimeter IVL balloon, go to two atmospheres and absolutely um, pave a beautiful highway for your 14 French impella or your 14 French uh, taver sheath. And there shouldn't be any issues in terms of having an iliac on a stick in a situation like that. So I think those are all great points. I guess the question I would ask uh, both of you uh, experienced guys, is there anything else that you would want in your toolbox, in your cath lab? You know, as you mentioned, a lot of these cases are done in the cath lab, not an OR. And the time to find out that you don't have a key component in your toolbox is not when the patient is crashing in shock, right? So you periodically want to know what your inventory is, a few times a year, check on yeah, things. Yeah, I, I mean, but in, in what our... Else do you need? Every lab should have, you know, the we call it the emergency aortic kit, but you, the, the, the bailout kit, whatever you want to call it. So in that box, we have all of the uh, large sheaths that would be available, your extra support wires, you know, your Amplat Super Stiff or your Super Core, uh, your, uh, uh, all, all the, you know, a Gore Dry, the Gore dry Seal sheaths. So we have uh, the, uh, the 8L and the 11 VBXs, which can be, uh, inflated all the way up to 16 millimeters. So that's what we have in the box. And, and John, I wanted to just add that Peter Monteleone and Jun Lee are, think, are leading an effort through Sky, to the Sky's fellow scores, and these cases that you and Bob demonstrated would be front and center, is to share some fundamental anatomic techniques and device-based knowledge, specific balloons and catheter and guide guidewire information that would help endovascular, uh, sorry, structural and coronary operators to have the basics to be set up for uh, bailing themselves out. I think that's good. Agreed. Be, and in I some way, it's going to save somebody's life, right, at some point, where if you don't act quickly and don't have the right tools and haven't seen this happen, even in a 
recorded case, you may not be able to, to get there quick enough, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, I think there is another area which I think uh, many perform for myocardial ischemia even, subclavian intervention. So uh, I would invite Dr. Yolanda Castro from University Hospitals in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, to share how knowledge and uh, endovascular knowledge and skills can help you uh, deliver success in subclavian artery interventions. Yolanda, thank you for being here. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Somebody this closer. So we'll start with a couple cases. Um, actually, we'll do our, our first case. is a 70-year-old woman with a history of smoking, hypertension, and COPD who reported left arm heaviness uh, while doing activities. Uh, she's a farmer, and she has a lot of arm discomfort uh, that limits how much she's able to do in her farm. On exam, she has a decreased left vertebral pulse. Uh, right arm pressures are 140, and the, on the left arm is 105. So a big differential of pressures between right and left side. Uh, based on this uh, symptoms and based on their you know lifestyle limiting, we do take it for angiogram. Uh, that and where we can evaluate, we can actually see very clearly that she has a significant left subclavian stenosis. So I'll ask my um, you know my my panelists and the moderators how would they approach this? I know every I know you're you're going to want everyone to say oh I just come from the arm to do this case, mm -hmm. and that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, but it's a, it's a type three arch, so it's gonna be a little bit more difficult in terms of cannulation, but if you use a catheter that points backwards, I mean, you could probably um, cannulize this with a JR4 diagnostic catheter, get a wire down there, put a quick cross, put an extra support wire, and then be able to bring up your sheath and or your guide and be able to do it in the normal anti-grade fashion. It can be challenging. I know we like to do everything from the radial, but you know, with the radial, it's going to be very difficult unless it's a, a, a big person to be able to put a seven French sheath. Um, if you're coming from below, you can use a seven French sheath that keeps all your options available, including IVL and the ability to put in a covered stent. And so um, I still like to do these from the femoral access. And then um, if you have any difficulty cannulating this, then a VTEC catheter, which we use very commonly, for carotid interventions would be a piece of cake and would sit in there very snugly and very stably. Yeah, and the, and the caveats to, to point out is if you're coming from below or above is, is how that stent's gonna be sitting proximally and how you're visualizing it. Of course, if you're coming from the arm, it's, it's hard to get those proximal pictures if you don't have view from below. One of the things we, you ask five people, you'll get two different opinions, but split is about um, embolic protection of that of that vert um, covered stents oftentimes maybe give you a little extra benefit, but um, yeah, there, there's there's a bunch of those little questions. I, I agree with Peter. Well, there are two surgeons here. Kevin, any comments? I I don't want to put you on the spot. Is there anything you would do different? Don't put me on the spot, but put me on the spot. <laughs> so actually, so the first question was where's the vert? So I wanted to know where the vert was uh, specifically no to. Lab, yeah. No. I'm, I'm no doubt Dr. Yeah. Castro looked for the vert. Um, so that would be obviously the first thing to evaluate. Um, I think for me, with my skill set, I do approach this from a brachial approach. Um, um, so that's, that's kind of my, my uh, go-to. I, I think Gavin and anyone else uh, wants to comment, I can walk up. But I think doing an arch angiogram completely or having a good quality CT before embarking on a subclavian artery intervention, even if it looks focal and simple, is probably the right thing to do. Uh, the, the Doppler or the carotids would be helpful to know if you have anagrade or retrograde flow in the vertebral. That's, that's often a help, help, helpful thing. Excellent point. So a lot of planning goes into it. So continue, please. Question would be, you know, if you choose uh, to, you know, to go with a brachial approach, do you, uh, what do you do to image? Do you image everything from a brachial uh, standpoint? Do you use another catheter to get an arch angiogram, or do you just image everything from your brachial? So I, I think the arch comments are absolutely important. So you do um, kind of, that's what you lose when you have an occlusion, let's say. I mean, you have to cross the lesion to get a good arch angiogram, right? And so then where do you land it? I uh, tend to have, you know, I think in most of these patients, the other thing that they usually kind of come with, unless they have renal disease, is a CTA. Mm -hmm. So that can also provide some information up front about the challenging anatomy that you may or may not have. The duplex comment is absolutely critical. 
And so in my planning, you know, that would certainly guide whether I go through transfemoral or radial, um, I'm sorry, or brachial. Continue, Yolanka. Let's see how Perfect, this case yeah. unfolds. Yeah. So before we go to that, I wanted to just address a couple of the comments regarding the toolbox. So for access, when we were thinking about um, uh, subclavian interventions, we can think about transfermal access, which, you know, there may be some preference regarding what you want to do. Uh, transradial, which has its limitations in terms of their sheath uh, size, brachial, and, you know, as uh, uh, Dr. Hart was mentioning, uh, a lot of the vascular surgery colleagues will tend to use more of a brachial with a cut down approach, which, will let, uh, which allow them to have better control. Uh, and when you use a, uh, an arm approach, you actually get better support if you actually have a CTO uh, of your subclavian. Uh, in terms of sheaths, you can go from six to seven French to eight French, depending on what you're dealing with. Uh, go from 45 to 90 CM, 45, you're going from the arm. Uh, and, and, some, and some people may also use a short sheath and use a guiding catheter all the way, but we typically will use more of a longer sheath if you're going from femoral. And then for selective catheters, typically you can do this with a JR4, or if you're going from femoral axis, or a vertebral catheter, or a VTEC, like, uh, uh, like Peter was mentioning. And then we also mentioned the embolic protection device. Um, and that is important, uh, and definitely to consider, especially if you're doing an innominate intervention, and you can place a, uh, the embolic protection device in the common carotid. Uh, and then in the left side, it becomes less important, but uh, you can also place an embolic protection device in the vert or the brachial, depending if you have a thrombotic occlusion. Uh, and then you got it very important to identify the landmarks, very important to identify the osseum of your subclavian, which we can do that uh, once you're able to get into your arch and take a good uh, picture, take a good angiogram, identify the origin of your retrieval and also the origin of IMA. Important to use oblique angulations and also use road mapping in order to be able to identify all the landmarks. And of course, as mentioned before, you gotta have a good pre-op uh, duplex and also sometimes a CTA is very useful to identify exactly uh, where, where is the location of your, um, lo the location of your occlusion, what sort of your vertebral flow, like if your vertebral is occluded in one side, how does the vertebral on the other side uh, behave as well? So it's really important to understand that in the, in the preoperative phase. And then use IVIS. It's really important to identify uh, how calcified the vessel is and the vessel size as well. In terms of stents, you know, we typically use a balloon expandable stent for the osteum that's reclaiming that osteum and proximal part. That's where you're more commonly going to find this type of stenosis and occlusions. Um, when you use this balloon expandable stents, you'll have greater radial force and accurate placement. And we try to avoid cover in the bacterial and IMA, and we tend to use more cover stents when it's highly calcified or if there's any presence of thrombus. And this is just some diagrams um, that I found that were you know, actually pretty useful and how you can do this from a femoral or, or a brachial approach. And one tip that I remember uh, Carlos used to always tell me, whenever you had uh, from a femoral approach, when you had a really difficult lesion to cross, it was pretty calcified, it's actually pretty useful after you do angioplasty um, of that lesion to actually advance your teeth past the lesion, okay, uh, using that balloon to track and then place your stent in distal to in that sheath where the lesion is and then remove your sheath back. That way, you know, you won't have difficulty crossing with a balloon expandable stent, a very tight lesion. Uh, and also, it also prevents the risk of potential embolization of your stent. And if you're coming from a brachial approach in a similar way, some people may need to use either, uh, if you have a total occlusion, you may need to use a second catheter from a femoral approach to image, or once you cross, you can also image as well. Now there's some caveats always with any subclavian intervention. You gotta understand the potential limitations. Uh, if, you, if there's a risk of compromising vertebral flow, understand, as I mentioned, the contralateral vertebral flow as well. And identify when an open surgical repair is a better option in some patients, especially in those with long CTOs, so very hard to cross. And you know, we should always try to aim for endo first, but it's not always the answer. Now, looking into the case, so I did go from a femoral approach uh, in her case. Uh, and what we did, we used a seven French 90 cm sheath, uh, and actually we did IVIS, identified a vessel size, and actually placed an eight by 20 uh, Omnilink stank in her case. We had a really good result, and she actually had significant improvement in her arm claudication symptoms. And I have a second case. There's a 62 year old woman who presented, uh, she has a history of smoking, ENT cancer, prior radiation, uh, who presented with a sudden onset painful and discolored left index finger. finger. On exam, she had a decreased left radial and ulnar pulses, and she did have a, a, a CTA that showed a pretty ulcerated, you know, very severe stenosis in her uh, proximal subclavian that had an ulcerated appearance. 
And the concern with this presentation was that she likely, since it was a sudden onset, as she probably had a significant subclavian stenosis that was ulcerated and then potentially embolized uh, down to her finger in the way that she presented. So, and this is her initial angiogram. And uh, again, what would be, for the Peters, what would be your approach? <laughs> All right, that's, uh, that's super nasty. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks like um, if you didn't know the history, you would be like, is that a big rock of calcium or is that a clot? Uh, with the history, I think you have to assume that it's clot. And it's sitting right there at the origin of the left vertebral artery. And so we don't routinely do embolic protection uh, but in this particular case, um, if I was going to decide to tackle it from an endo standpoint, I probably would put a filter, probably take an embo shield, uh, an 014 uh, wire, put an embo shield into the vert, take an 018 wire, send that down the arm, and then do the intervention over the 018 wire. If I thought it was clot, I would even consider perhaps even doing a second embolic uh, protection device so it doesn't go down to the hand, use some type of thrombectomy device, take another picture, see what it looked like. If I still wasn't sure if it was clot versus calcium, then you can always throw an IVUS in there at any point, and that should help delineate what the etiology of this filling defect is. Perfect, great. Uh, so yeah, so we took more pictures on the arm. Uh, and actually that showed that, that ul the ulnar artery was actually uh, had very decreased flow in her case. That actually explains uh, the situation that was going on in her. And just in the interest of time, we took more images. We did IBIS identified. It was predominantly an ulcerated plaque. Actually, no significant thrombus that we needed to do the thrombectomy for. We did place uh, an embo shield uh, down her brachial, actually, because we thought that vertebral was actually quite small, and she did have good flow in the other vertebral as well, based on the prior CT scan. So we placed, uh, in her case, a 7, uh, a seven by 29 BVX, and this is not playing correctly for some reason. This is... Um uh, but yeah, so, but we were able to preserve the vert <laughs> in her case, and... Um, but yeah, this, I'm going to leave it like that in that last case. Oh, this is supposed to play, but it's not playing. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another great demonstration of, uh, of how uh, these skills overlap. Uh, let's, you know, we are doing a lot more PE interventions, and I think cardiologists are getting involved with venous disease. So I'm going to invite uh, uh, Dr. Hart to talk about chronic iliocaval DVT, what we should take home from a surgeon. Thank you so much. Um, I'll make this quick to try to help us catch up. But So I'm going to present a case of chronic iliocable DVT. These are my disclosures, none relevant. So we have a 71-year-old male with a history of lower extremity DVT, had a filter placed in the setting of a traumatic bleed. Um, they tried to anticoagulate this patient, but the bleed um, was getting worse. So some time passed, and he was cleared to go back on anticoagulation. He, uh, unfortunately, within a year of this, presented with a worsening edema, right lower extremity venous claudication. He was very compliant with compression and anticoagulation, but had clearly some lifestyle limiting uh, venous disease. And with the history, you, you know, you wonder what's going on with that filter, because there was a period where he was off anticoagulation. Pertinent history, he had a remote filter placed back in 2010, so he has a prothrombotic disorder. He was actually diagnosed with factor V light, and this was subsequently removed appropriately at that time. And in 2022, this is where he had this uh, intramural hematoma with expansion le leading to this filter in a pretty prolonged period of holding his uh, anticoagulation. So when he came for evaluation of the venous claudication and the edema, he had a venous insufficiency study and a venous duplex. And this is a really sort of detailed report, but very much uh, letting me know that there's a lot of post-thrombotic changes in this patient, both on the right and the left, with partially compressible chronic changes in uh, at all levels from the common femoral down to the popliteal vein uh, and with reflux associated with it on both sides. And in particular, if you look at the left, um, there's quite significant atrophy or small caliber with uh, more extensive chronicity on that left lower extremity. 
Uh, I like to get axial imaging when I start to think about a patient for reconstruction just to get a sense of what to prepare for. So in this CAT scan, which was running here, uh, you could see that there was significant atresia and stenosis around the filter. But otherwise, it looks like fairly viable um, residual lumen at the iliac level down into the groin. So um, with this information, this patient comes, who would, um, I guess, what would folks do? Well, first, let's see a show of hands. Who does some deep venous work? Okay, great. So what would be, uh, is, what would be the next step here? Do you know I can come to you? You want to say a word here? Here, here's a microphone for you. So the, the question, I guess, is, you know, we have the finding of CT and the venous, you know, how far up in the CT goes you at the IVC, if it's open or not, um, and, and then probably proceed, you can look at your ultrasound and then proceed to venogram. Yeah, so open to just um, about the renals, a little below the renals. Right, at, at which point now you're looking at what's acute and what's chronic? So and we're a year out, anticoagulated, chronic disease. Right. So in this situation, again, looking at you know reconstruction of those of that of that vessel, it's been your year out. You're not really dealing with uh, chronic. You know, you're, you're not looking at acute. You're looking at chronic change. Yeah. So, does anyone um, would any let's see a show of hands of those who do work like this? Um, who would go straight to intervention? Meaning remove of the filter and reconstruct. Who would do a diagnostic venogram? There are more hands for diagnostic. Okay, who venogram. would do something else? <laughs> so I used to go right to diagnostic venogram, but I got to say, um, because I like to roadmap, I like to get all the information. There's a lot of devices that aren't sitting on my shelf. I like to prepare ahead of time. So um, what I found with that going straight to diagnostic venogram is that I'm still left with not knowing the inflow, and that is profunda. I mean, an anagrade uh, venogram from either the midfemoral vein or the popliteal vein, you're just not going to get that information. Um, and most of these patients are occluded, so you're not going to get that approach to come in from the jugular and look down and cannulate it and get that information. An IVUS, same thing. It's an integrated approach. You're not going to get a good view of what's going on in the profunda. And so um, with our vascular lab, uh, I've kind of gone on to, and, and yes, we had that venous insufficiency study, but most protocols don't have a detailed view of what I'm looking for. And again, that's inflow. So I do... Uh, now, with a couple of my trained RVTs, we do a special dedicated inflow study for uh, the venous system. So we look specifically at common femoral, profunda down to two orders, and then um, just a proximal femoral vein because that's the sort of less critical. But in this patient, that's what we did next um, before going to intervention. So just measuring uh, kind of the diameter. Actually, you can get a better sense of synechia. I think post thrombotic changes are seen best on duplex than even IVUS. I think IVUS underestimates some of these chronic changes. Um, and so on the right side, much like the duplex showed, we had a very nice lumen. Um, on the bottom here, you could see that on the cross view, the long view, we have this excellent, beautiful image of what the profunda vein is doing. You know exactly what profunda is. I think on a venogram, there's so many collaterals at the groin. Sometimes you can't tell what's a circumflex, what's profunda, and what's going on. So I think these views really kind of help. And so on the left lower extremity, we also confirmed that the patient had a good profunda, a good open uh, diameter, there was good flow. I mean, the study comes with the flow uh, evaluation as well. And consistent with the duplex, a very atretic, more narrowed uh, femoral vein, which really became an issue because we had to encount, uh, deal with that as a, a way of accessing to get into the IVC. So the clinical challenge is addressing the patient's symptoms. That involves removing the filter and doing a reconstruction here. I think removing the filter alone would not have addressed his symptoms. And so I'll just talk a lot about some technique stuff. So from an access standpoint, I think single access is not going to help, help you get this reconstruction done. You might be able to do it with dual, but you still got to remove the filter. So in my, in my case, these are always three-point three access type cases coming from below for uh, ultimate reconstruction and then from the jugular for the filter retrieval. Positioning, you know, there's prone, there's supine, and both. And what I mean by that is you flip from one to the other. I think it's hard to do these prone. I think when you're working in the neck in a challenging filter case, it's really uncomfortable to do it prone, and there's, it comes with problems for the patient from a respiratory standpoint. Supine, I think sometimes, especially in very heavy edematous, thick legs, it's hard to get access in the pop from a, pro, a supine approach strictly. So I usually, um, when, I, when I know this is going to be challenging, I put them prone first, get access, then flip them back onto the table, prepping everything in, and then we're completely supine, then I have the jugular available as a third access point. 
So in this, uh, so these are sort of my go-tos in a complex case. Um, I never access at the groin. I think you want to know where that profunda is. You want to use the lesser trochanter as your landmark. That's around the level of where the profunda comes in and joins the femoral vein and don't get fooled. Just always remember the profunda vein hugs the femur. Femoral vein is a little bit off of that. So if your wire's kind of hugging the femur, you know, you're probably thinking you may be in a collateral that led you into the profunda. Um, so don't, don't go near the groins. So then, how else do we resolve this challenge? Well, you really want to be prepared for all of, all of the thing. You want to have everything you need to do the reconstruction. So for the filter retrieval, you want to have your different snares available or choices. I think for me, an endobronchial forceps does really well. And there are different forceps, some that fit with the laser, some that don't. So you want to kind of know which one you have. And laser, uh, you always have as a backup, but uh, rarely need to use it. Sheaths from the, groin, from the popliteal thigh area, you, if, you're just, um, if it's not an acute case, so this is a chronic case, you want to at least be thinking about an 8 to a 10 French because that's what's going to help you deliver the balloons you want and deliver the stents you want. From the neck, um, up to an 18 French, depending on how hard or easy it is to remove the filter. Obviously, if it's just a snare, you're not going to need that 18 French, but you want to have it available. I use all long wires, stiff wires, a stiff glide, and amplats, and sometimes a super core. And I like the one centimeter tipped on the implants. It gives me a little bit more stability. Imaging-wise, obviously, you're going to use a venography. Use your obliquities. You want to use IVIS. Um, in uh, complex cases for re a recanalization where we've had to do sharp recanalization, sometimes we use CT reconstruction on table with fluoro um, to help us guide that sharp recanalization. Balloon-wise, you know, you, it's a very different to treat a five-foot patient than a six-foot patient. And if you're coming from the popliteal vein, you are going to be left uh, short uh, in length to get to the cava if you have the standard 80 centimeter long balloons. I like high pressure balloons, so I like to have the 120 centimeter long available for us. That means ordering them ahead of time. Um, and if you're working in the cava, you want to have 20 plus uh, millimeter size balloons available, uh, and also 12s and 14s, so if you want to do a kissing balloon approach. You want to pre dilate your vessels, you want to do one to one to what you anticipate you're going to um, stent into or a stent up to in terms of size. And from a revascularization standpoint, again, sometimes the femoral vein can be challenging. You may have to dilate it just to get the sheets up to deliver the stents, but I do prolonged uh, angioplasty of the femoral vein if I need to. Uh, you want to have self-expanding stents available. Occasionally, if I have to go across the renal veins, I'll use a C-stent as a cuff, because um, I wouldn't want to jail the renal vein, so I'll use that and then do kissing reconstruction into the Z-stent and then post-dilate your, your stents to a one-to-one -one approach. Medicine, the medical part is just as important as the technical part. You could be a great technician, but if you don't really treat these patients with the right medicines and the right approach, in my mind, I think you're uh, putting yourself at risk of having your procedure fail. So procedurally, obviously, heparin, I don't, proto I don't reverse any of it. No protamine. Uh, Post-procedurally, it's Lovenox for a month for me, antiplatelets for three months and then ultimately switch them to a DOAC based on their clinical exam and how good the duplex looks and if there's nice respirophasic flow. Uh, when they leave the operating room, for me, they're leaving with SCDs, wraps, and um, pumping their legs right away. So here's this case. Um, the filter was already removed from a jugular approach. We did start prone, then went to supine. Um, so he's in a supine approach here. We have a lot of post-traumatic changes, which were confirmed with IVIS, a lot of stagnant column, a buildup there on the right side. Obviously, his right leg was the venous claudication side, but I can't fix the right without fixing the left, and so I got to reconstruct the IVC. So we did uh, kissing balloon stents all the way up uh, 14 to just below the renals, uh, pre-dilated all the vessels, and post-dilated the stents once I put them in. I did prolonged insufflation at the common femoral uh, to prepare this for stents and landed the stents in, in, um, from the top-down approach all the way down to the groins. Here's an image of IVIS, just to show you on the left panel is the pre-reconstruction and the right post-reconstruction with the kissing uh, stents up to the IVC with much uh, significant improved uh, luminal diameter on the outflow side and the iliacs. So this is uh, just this one particular case, but really this is the list of everything I think about when I'm preparing for such a case. Post-procedure, just real quickly showing the duplex of his... Um, from the groins looking just where the stents come in, and you can see there's both nice respirophasic flow on both sides, and the patient's edema is improved as well as the venous claudication. So key learning points, I think these cases can be complex. They're challenging. You want to really have your toolbox ready to go and have all the things ready and think about what you need and have all the imaging ready ahead of time so you know if a patient is a candidate or not. If there's any question about inflow 
or the ability to anticoagulate. In my book, this is a stop, a hard stop. So and with that, I will end. Thank you. Karen, it seems like a long day and lots of coffee, huh? This is a great case. So, Peter, you are next. You've given this talk many, many times before. So, uh, show us in a few minutes your tips and tricks to avoid iliac complications. Sure. Uh, we are running a little short. I may skip my presentation and move on. So, Anand, you're next, and then we'll move on to the last one. all of us, and insufficient vessel expansion, can't get the vessel open, you're gonna have, and if you do put in stent, you won't be able to expand the stent, which puts it at risk for resinosis or thrombosis. Inadequate size, you know, vessel prep until the L6 device became available, we just didn't have adequately sized vessel prep devices. Thankfully, we now do. And, and then, of course, there's the issue of whenever you're doing a reconstruction that involves uh, the bifurcation or close to the bifurcation is the fact that a lot of these patients have multi-segment disease. So if you just do kissing stents into the aorta every time, you're going to really make your future life much more difficult because you're not going to be able to go up and over. And that can be a real real problem because it's very difficult to reach, especially if you have to come from the arm. You know, we don't like to put five, six slender sheaths in the tibial artery. Sometimes you don't have that, that luxury. So if you can preserve the ability to go up and over and get a standalone result, that's actually a major advantage. And then, of course, dissection and perforation. Calcified vessels can dissect and they can perforate, and obviously perforation is a life-threatening complication. And this is the one that we always worry about the most, which is a frank life-threatening perforation. I've mentioned this once, I'll mention it again. You need to have that emergency aortic kit because uh, perforation is a life-threatening emergency, and you need to have all the goodies right there in the valve. You can't be having people running in and out of the room. Everything has to be there because every second counts. Um, and these are the devices that we have in our lab. These slides are gonna be available, so you can just uh, take a look at them at your leisure. And you have to know the predictors of complications with calcified lesions. Clearly, calcified arteries and CTOs are the most important complications than, of course, large bore axis as well. So my uh, tip, number, uh, tip number one was have that uh, uh, stuff available in your, in, in, your, in your room. Tip number two is to use IVL. I showed this slide earlier. Remember that the eight and the nines go through a seven, the tens and twelves go through an eight. And the nice thing about these shorter balloons is if you have a significant disparity between the size of your common iliac artery and your external iliac artery, with the older device, you might be a little nervous about putting a six centimeter IVL balloon, like a, an eight, and if, if you had a small, especially a little old lady who's got a smallish EIA, the beauty of these shorter balloons is that you can be a lot more uh, a focal in terms of your therapy uh, delivery, and so less likelihood of getting uh, a, 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 um, a dissection. Uh, we know from the uh, Disrupt PAD cohort that uh, IVL is incredibly safe, and in this particular study, um, no dissections, no perfs, no reflow. And my tip number three is use covered stents. So this has been a sort of a recurring theme, but for exactly these kinds of lesions, the task C and Ds, the bifurcations, the heavily calcified lesions, the CTOs, it is in fact a uh, 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 class one indication to use them. So let's just jump into our first case. Um, this was a patient, uh, actually our first L6 case that we did. Uh, this guy was on TV. He's one of these guys who makes these really cool um, knives, you know, forged in fire. And, um, and after I show you the uh, result of this case, I'm happy to tell you that he made one for me, which was really nice. I never use it to I just put it up on the wall to have it to show, but very beautiful knives. Anyway, so you can see he's got severe calcific disease. He's got an, a severe lesion with an occlusion of the um, uh, common iliac. Pretty nasty disease. He's got that CFA stenosis. We predilated with 4 by 40 put a 7 millimeter IVL in that common femoral, and then dilated that up with uh, the remainder of our pulses, looking pretty good. And then it was time for the bunker buster, which is what I like to call the L6 device. So we're able to then take an 8 by 30 L6 to treat that common iliac disease. Looking pretty good, DCB 7 millimeter for the common femoral and then some smart controls for the external iliac. And so at this point, we're like, all right, 
we've, we've secured the hill for the left side. Now let's go to the challenging fun side, which is that right uh, iliac occlusion. Um, this was a flush occlusion, so we decided to come from a retrograde approach. Not a great C-top type of a lesion either, so we knew this was going to be a little bit of a work. Uh, and we tried to go retrograde with a front runner. Unfortunately, we went subintimal, tried a wingman to try to different, find a different spot. That also um, resulted in a subintimal wire. But, you know, you're working on one end, your fellow's working on the other end, and hopefully the two of you meet in the middle and you're eventually able to get across. In this particular case, we were able to finally get across anagrade and PTA'd with a small balloon. Uh, uh, in case, God forbid, we were at the level of the adventitia. Pre-dilated, obviously doesn't look pretty, still very calcified. So we went ahead and took that um, same L6 balloon to use up the, the, the rest of the pulses on that side. And then after some self-expanding stents, we then reconstructed the uh, bifurcation there with a couple of covered stents and really ended up with a, a very nice result after post dilatation with a nine millimeter balloon. Uh, and you can see that um, got a lovely result, went home the same day, and I got a really cool knife as a, as a parting gift. All right, so here's another example. Um, let me just go back here if I can for a sec. This is a little bit more of a challenging case. This is a complete occlusion of the aorta with occlusive disease of the common iliacs. This patient absolutely refused to let me send him for an aorta by fem, and so um, I said, all right, well, I will give it a shot. So our initial approach usually for these is to try to come from above, cross integrate. Uh, so we had lots of access. We had triple access. We had left brachial and bilateral common femoral access. And again, you try from above, we weren't successful. We tried from below, initially we were unsuccessful, uh, but then did get through with a glide wire, snared that from below, delivered our wire retrograde into the aorta, then we were able to go ahead and cross successfully on the right side with a front runner. And then at that point, it's like, all right, now we can start the case. So uh, after uh, doing all of that, we did uh, pre-dilation. You'll notice I used very small balloons initially. And uh, I was like, okay, no perforation, thank God, let's move on. And then, of course, IVUS. You know, you've been hearing over and over again about IVUS. Well, there's a good reason for that, because it's really helpful. You know exactly what size vessels you're dealing with. And you can see here that our distal aorta was a little over 12 millimeters. This was then followed by kissing shockwave balloons for the aorta and iliac bifurcations. Looking pretty darn good here just after IVL. And then um, we did our top hat and trouser, so we put a um, balloon expandable stent in the distal aorta and then kissing stents into that top hat, the trousers, and then uh, uh, definitive therapy with eight millimeter VBX stents and really a very nice result. And the guy, this guy also went home, did not get a parting gift, unfortunately. Anyway, um, let me show you one more here. This was a case that we did recently, severe aortoiliac bifurcation, which as we know is the, is the one that's really risky for occlusive disease. So again, we IVist after we crossed, we, there was a 60 millimeter gradient across um, this, this big boy uh, right up here, which had progressed from a prior angiogram, so-called apple core lesion. And IVIS showed that uh, we were dealing with a 12 by 14 millimeter above this rock pile, and then a four by four millimeter lumen at the site. And then also there was significant disease there at the origin of the common iliac. And so tip number four, use IVIS. Confirm your intraluminal, properly size the vessel, figure out how much calcium you have and how am I gonna treat it. Typically that's gonna be with IVL. And then of course, Pioneer Plus with IVIS is really helpful as we heard this morning in terms of re-entry back into the aorta. And so this was a 12 millimeter L6 balloon and I used all 300 pulses because you wouldn't just have half a beer, you're gonna drink your whole beer, I'm gonna use all 300 pulses, get my money's worth. And then after IVL, really impressive improvement in that luminal enlargement, and then kissing IVLs for the bifurcation, looks pretty darn good here after IVL, and then a balloon expandable stent. And the reason we didn't use a covered stent here is because if you, if you noticed early on that this patient had bilateral accessory renal arteries and I didn't wanna jail them, and so for that reason, we ended up putting a, a bare metal stent here approximately. But I felt comfortable doing that because we had adequately prepared with the 12 millimeter IVL balloon. And so this is what it looked like post and then after a 
12 millimeter post dilatation balloon, you can see a really excellent result there. And this was our final um, result. We preserved the flow to both accessories. We had standalone result in the IVL. And the reason why that was important is because she had this uh, fem, uh, fem pop bypass that was occluded and had this rock pile in her native popliteal artery and she's still having symptoms. So we were able to go up and over and initially got through that with a go, a go back, orbital atherectomy to make a channel, IVL, post IVL, DCB, beautiful result, complete resolution of her symptoms with restoration of three vessel runoff. So my tips to avoid complications in the, uh, of calcified iliac lesions, again, always use seven French sheaths or greater. In case you have a perf, use IVL, use covered stents, use IVIS, and always have the emergency aortic kit in the room, not if, but when disaster strikes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I just want to add to your emergency kit one suggestion, just yes. my humble, is to add the Tyshak balloon. I have two rationales for it. Number one, it is not the greatest balloon to have to dilate, but it is the largest low profile sheath requiring balloon. So think about a distal aortic occlusion before you want to call your surgeon, Dr. Hart, Dr. Balaramanan, and you want to occlude the aorta. What size French so sheath is I was just coming, a 30 millimeter coda balloon for distal aortic occlusion requires a minimum a 12 French sheath. A 18 millimeter diameter tie shack goes through seven, and a 20 up to a 20 goes through a eight French. So Ooh. if you can put a second sheath versus a 12 after a perforation, uh, the, if you want to give your new hospital a long list, I suggest if you are an interventionalist and going to do aortic occlusion, aortic interventions, ask for a tie shack balloon. It is a, not a great balloon for treatment, but it is a great balloon to have and go to sleep with it because it is a great peace of mind. Yeah, the one that we have, uh, we have a coda balloon, but we also have, Merit makes an aortic occlusion balloon that goes through a 10 French sheath, but that's, an eight is even better. And, and, and for full disclosure, I have no conflicts with anyone who makes that balloon. So uh, these days you have to <laughs> emphasize that. But anyway, fantastic talk, Peter. We learned a lot from you. Uh, our next topic, so you can see the theme here uh, of all the skills that a, any structural or coronary interventionalist needs to have to do these cases successfully. Uh, next are a, a closure device complications. Uh, we all use them for pre and post closure and what can happen and how to diagnose and treat them. Uh, I invite Dr. Anand Prasad, who's the program director of uh, interventional cardiology at UT San Antonio. Anand, great. The other you. balloon is uh, ZMED. ZMEDs go through uh, uh, sheets. So, okay, uh, this is a talk where I show my underwear off, right? So, this is. Uh, Complications talk, they're all my complications, so you know, judge me how you will. <clears throat> so uh, there's no shortage of closure devices on the market, and particularly for the fellows as they're starting off, you wanna get familiar with a couple of extravascular closure devices, get comfortable with per-close, angioseal, some of the intravascular ones, and just remember that at the end of the day, you know, manual pressure is still valuable. That's a skill set that I think is being lost, and uh, remember, manual pressure will bail you out of a lot of different things. So, you know, if I had to tell you what the most common complication that I have in my cath lab, it's with extravascular closure devices, okay? That's the most common. And the site looks good. You finished your intervention, and invariably they move or they uh, bear down, and 30, 40 minutes later, you're bleeding. Uh, so, you know, kind of the typical case of diseased artery, this patient, we wanted to close because they were going to be transported to the OR. You know, what's supposed to happen is you put that extravascular plug in and it seals up, but what often happens is you have leakage around, and that can lead to this complication, which is a pseudoaneurysm formation, which is not uncommon when you have extravascular closure and then a large uh, hematoma afterwards. So in this case, you know, the patient got a thrombin uh, injection. Uh, but what we're really seeing today is a lot of large bore access, right? So large bore access bleeding is a lot more stressful. So let's go over a few cases. This was a case of instant restenosis in a, a patient with severe LV dysfunction, uh, impella-guided, you know, PCI. That, that part was all straightforward. Here's the femoral access site, and it looks fairly good, a large, large vessel. And we did the usual 10 and 2, two dual uh, per-closes ahead of time. Uh, ultrasound guided anterior wall sticks. Um, and then we do a puff up and over and there's no flow at the common femoral artery, right? 
So uh, at that point, you know, the, the plan is to wire it. You go up and over. This is where your peripheral skills are, are really helpful. Uh, in this case, a 018 wire crossover. And, uh, you know, at that point, you know, ideally you want that wire to get into the SFA, right? That's the ideal thing. But uh, in this case, we just get into the, a branch of the Profunda and dilate, and you can see the tight stenosis of the 5.0. You serially dilate that with a 6.0. And what you're really trying to do is if you tighten the percloses too tightly, you're trying to loosen them up, right? And uh, so here's the final result. I used to have a lot of anxiety. You know, I started doing TAVRs about 10 years ago. And uh, when I first started, I had a lot of anxiety about these pinched common femorals, right? The endovascular part of me was like, how can you walk away with pinched common femoral? No big deal. Just they have no symptoms. Just be grateful and, and walk away. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, what are the causes after perclose failure? Possibly a dissection flap in some cases, uh, but more often than not, you cinch the artery a little too tight. So here are some on pearls, particularly for perclose use. Uh, you know, image right after, don't just close and say, okay, it seems okay, and walk away. I really try to image that vessel after large bore access. And you can do that even with, if you don't want a second access, if you do single access, use a small microdilator and, and inject through there. Uh, if the artery is small, I've gotten away from the 10 and 2 and the 2 percloses. I use a single 12 o'clock uh, per close, uh, and you know, you really look at ultrasound and look at the anatomy. And I, I'll show you a case next, but I, I really tell my fellows, try to leave a centimeter of landing zone above the uh, Profunda and uh, SFA bifurcation, just so you can land a covered stent without stressing if, if you need to. So this is a uh, lesson learned the hard way. So this was, uh, you know, a, a, a day I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to leave. My wife's like, get home. And I was like, no problem. I got one case. I'll knock it out. And it was a 77-year-old woman. They called me from the MICU. She's uh, on multiple pressors, mixed picture shock, morbidly obese, severe aortic stenosis. Mean gradient was like 70. So my plan was, uh, let me, you know, balloon this valve, and we'll stabilize her. In a few weeks, we can look at her for a TAVR. Uh, so this is the anatomy here, and you can see the bifurcation on the femoral head is very high. And you can see the landing zone to get access is very narrow, and, uh, you know, it's pretty high up there. So my technique in this case, I couple ultrasound with micropuncture. I use a four French cook micropuncture uh, system, and I use the microdilator in there, and I inject a little bit of 50-50 contrast with DSA, and I actually do that for all my femoral cases. So I have ultrasound plus this sheath uh, shot, and if I don't like it, I just pull out, hold, you know, five minutes of pressure, and I can restick it. So it looks like a pretty good access, right, all things considered. Uh, she's unstable, and, and, you know, there's this concern that she might need an impella uh, after we balloon her valve. So I said, let's just go ahead with the 12 French sheath, and we can upsize that. And I think that's, that would turn out to be a little bit of a mistake. Uh, and so, you know, blood pressure improves. She does actually quite well, right? I get the gradient down. LVEDP is not high, so maybe it's more sepsis than anything. I put my percloses in. One of them breaks, so I, I say, let's stick an 8-French angioseal and send her back up to the MICU. Uh, an hour later, a nurse calls, hypotension. You know, ICU resident calls me and says, does she have an umbilical hernia? And I'm, I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 didn't, I didn't look. I don't know. Uh, so on my exam, she has a pulsatile large mass below the umbilicus. The groin seems soft, though, so that's good, right? And CT is ordered, and that's what we see on the CT. So it's read as a 23 centimeter by 12 by 9 rectus sheath hematoma with active extravasation. Definitely the biggest hematoma I've ever had, 23 centimeters. So I take her back, stick the other side up and over, and you can see where she's bleeding from, right? Right at the access site. Doesn't look too bad, but it's brisk and, you know, it needs to be controlled. You can see how uncomfortably close that is to the uh, Profunda and SFA bifurcation, right? That's why when you can stick a little bit higher. Uh, so in this case, balloon tamponade doesn't work, and end up, uh, you know, landing a, a Viabon, just lucky enough not to lose the Profunda. So, uh, you know, the key lesson here is don't ever think you can go home. And, and we've done a lot of valvuloplasties now and kind of mirroring what Subash has talked about, where I use both radial arteries, I put two peripheral balloons, and I do the valvuloplasty that way, and you avoid one large bore axis. Uh, so I'm going to uh, finish with one last thing, Manta device. How many of y'all use the Manta here? 
Okay. So the Manta is essentially an angiocele on steroids, right? So it's a big one. It allows you to close things that you didn't pre-close ahead of time, so some, some distinct advantages. So, uh, you know, we had gotten the Manta. We were excited. We had done a bunch of cases in a row, and uh, we were like, man, we can use this for everybody. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So you can see this artery maybe is not the best Manta candidate. It's kind of small, uh, you know. We do the TAVR, it's great, um, you, know, uh, a, you know, the access looks good, no bleeding. This is my post-angio after the TAVR on that site. Looks okay. So one hour later, in the middle of the next TAVR, the nurse calls and says she's having severe leg pain. And this is the angio then. So you can see occluded vessel. So, uh, you know, what are the possibilities? Same as sort of an angio seal, you can have dissection from that foot plate. You might have pushed the collagen into the artery. Uh, might be thrombus there. There's no, it's not easy to come back from a manta occlusion. So, you, you know, perclose, you can do a lot of stuff, right? You can bake, break the perclose, you can do things. When you have a manta occlusion, it's very hard. So the surgeon basically cut, cut her open right there, and there was multiple problems. The collagen was partially in the artery, and the foot plate was stuck in, in plaque. So takeaways uh, from that case, you know, I, from then on, if I see anything plaque or anything that uh, uh, ultrasound, I don't use the Manta. I don't use it for small, small vessels. So with that, thank you. Uh, and remember, no matter how hard we try, we all have uh, some failures. Thank you. I think, Anand, no, no offense, man, but the right question might be, who are, how many of you are going to use it again? Uh, for Manta, but anyway, let me just uh, move very quickly. A few minutes over, and I'm going to flip through this very, very quickly. This is tips and tricks for managing axillary access, and uh, uh, and see uh, what happens. This is a TAVR case. I'm not going to bore you with TAVR and echoes because we are short on time. I'll just straight go to the matter of money. Uh, this is the patient's coronary disease. This is the patient's left-sided disease. Uh, and uh, this patient also has this problem. So I think that leaves us with limited number of options, and in some situations, after careful considerations, my vascular surgical colleagues are sitting in the audience who have done with this with me with careful planning, this could be done. So a few uh, options. Number one, if an, inter if an interventionalist is doing axillary access, you need to have another access. That cannot be your sole access. You need it for closure, uh, for occluding the vessel, and you need it for imaging. Uh, second is that you need to know which part of the axillary artery you're going to stick. Let me tell you pros and cons. Surgeons do it better. If they put in a graft, you can keep it for long term. If you stick it where interventionalists stick in the second or sometimes closer to the end of the second segment, uh, then uh, extending the arm for a long duration is not a feasibility. Second, there's also a risk of damaging the brachial plexus and causing a uh, lot of problems in the patient. So there are pros and cons uh, of each of these approaches. However, if done correctly, uh, a percutaneous access can be done with placement of a pre-closure. And I'll quickly go through this. This is sequential dilation for impeller placement after guide wire is placed. Uh, you know, my hands were uh, not very stable that day, <laughs> but uh, couldn't wire, put the perclose in. I'm sure you all have had this. But it could be easily uh, pre-closed, uh, and up to two pre-closures uh, can be uh, deployed in this area. So this is the first. The second one goes in, uh, and, uh, and you can uh, pre-close the vessel. But I think this is an important step. And the uh, last part is that when you actually deploy the pre-closure, you must have a contralateral balloon in the proximal axillary artery to occlude it uh, if needed. Or if in case you have a residual leak, you can quickly bring it into place. So these are all techniques for inter interventionalists. A surgeon can do a great job. In very obese patients, the, the, the fossa can be very hard and tricky to, uh, to access, and the depth the, uh, can be very, very large. And also, the distance from the axillary uh, delta pectoralis groove to the actual artery can be extremely uh, long distance. So you can actually stick far more proximally than where you intend to. So, those are some important uh, uh, tips and tricks. Uh, slowly dilate the artery. Generally, the axillary artery is not heavily calcified, so sometimes that provides an option. And, uh, and after sequential dilation, you can then bring in uh, your impeller sheath and then uh, do an angiogram before you do that, uh, definitely, and then uh, bring in your, uh, your impeller device, 
I'm going to skip through this because there's not much to watch here. Uh, this was a lower profile impella. Uh, uh, this was, and then uh, do and complete your PCI. I'm going to skip through the PCI parts because uh, putting in stents uh, is not the focus of this presentation, and I want to have you see uh, Dr. Shishibur's uh, ex exquisite uh, display of uh, mid thigh stick. Both the, a complete revascularization was done in this case, uh, and after which, uh, now the main part is how do you withdraw the impella and close the axis? I think that's the message here. So you get the uh, impella out, and then use a snare technique to grab your wire uh, from the right radial to be able to have access down the brachial artery. It is important to grab it because if you try to just extend it and pass a balloon to occlude a seven French or a, uh, a seven uh, or eight millimeter balloon, you're going to prolapse it back into the aorta. So it is very important to grab it and not waste time. And that could be done. Uh, take an angio, and after closure, take an angio again. And if you have any residual leak, the balloon could be expanded, uh, advanced, and closed, and then you have time to call in your surgeon. So these are some of the very, very simple uh, tips and tricks that one can employ if at some moment you have to do an accelerate cut down or accelerate access. Is this a sheet thing? No sheet. That's what I'm saying. You have to use the uh, snare to pull the guide wire so that you yeah. have anchored. When you took the picture, where did you take the picture? Yeah, you take the wire out. You take the wire out, advance the balloon, take a picture, and then put back the guide wire, of course. Uh, so I don't want to again uh, uh, belabor the point, uh, but thank you for this very brief opportunity to present. But I'm going to hand over the remaining part of my time to Dr. Shishibor. Maybe you just show you your last we have time. case. We can do it tomorrow. You, no, you can do it today. Go okay, for it. Could do it quickly then. You know, yeah, okay. no, problem. no problem. We'll do it. <laughs> Okay, we'll do it quick. So, watch the alternatively, can you use the radial, you know, to inject the dye and put a balloon there? And so, you know, it was nice that you snared it and everything, but, you know. I believe sometimes the size of the balloon can deploy to the Right. Okay. Okay. Can you guys put my slides because the folks want to go off to break and I hope there's good snack out there. If they don't want to put it up, it's okay too. Yeah. We're going to give you, we have 10 seconds. If you don't, if you take a little bit longer, it'd be great. We all go and <laughs> have a drink or have some. Okay, great. So I'm going to go fast too because I think all of you guys have mastered this. But maybe if you can let me go forward. Um, I, you know, the bottom line, if you take this message from this case, you can get access anywhere in their body, honestly, as long as you do it carefully use guidance, and that you know what you're doing. And uh, not to traumatize where you uh, uh, get your access, whether it's pedal, tibial, medial thigh, or whatever it is. Subash asked me to talk about medial thigh. We used to do this in the old days in a prone position, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We thought that was the best way to do it. It's actually the worst way to do it. All popliteal access, medial thigh, popliteal access should be done in a supine position like this. Supine position like this. And the way we do this, is basically in this way. So this is not the way to do it uh, because you want the artery, the needle, and, uh, and the eye eye all to be aligned with each other so you are right on top of the artery. So in this situation, the needle should have been where the, right, the red arrow is. That's the way you want to enter these arteries. So it doesn't matter where you are. And the way I describe it to people is that think uh, the needle is the X-ray beam or the ultrasound, you know, signals. You want your needle, think of the direction of those signals, and, the base, and look at the eye eye, and you want to make sure that the needle is going the same direction as the, as the eye eye or the x-ray beams, if you will. So this is a medial access. So the way we do it is that we have the patient in a supine position like this. We usually have a sheet up and over, and we are using the retrograde access to cross these uh, CTOs. And after we take a picture, we have dye. You can use roadmap. I personally don't like roadmap too much because patients move, our patients move all the time, and it can create artifact. All of these SFA and POPs have calcification, and you can use the calcification to guide you to get a retrograde access in the SFA POP. So, and again, once if you, are, you think you're in and it doesn't feel like you're in, or you can't pass the wire, you can go the contralateral 90 degrees, and it will show you basically 
like in this case, that I've crossed the, the artery and then I need to pull my needle back. Now, this was an access in a CTO. And you can get access in the SFA pop in a CTO. It's much more difficult in the tibials, almost maybe impossible. Sometimes you can get away with it. But in the SFA pop, you can actually get access as long as you pay attention to your loop. If your loop is too big, that means you're outside. If your loop is about three, four millimeters, you're most likely in the SFA pop, even in the CTO. So I was going to show you a quick case. Do we have time, Subash, for a quick case? Yes, yes. What time? So this is a 59-year-old, very complex patient. So I'm going to skip this story. No, not much blood flow, CLTI, Rutherford 5. And this was actually a live case, a live case I did seven years ago at the MAC Symposium, uh, Subash, uh, before CVI. And uh, iliacs look good. Uh, you can see that there is reasonable flow to the common femoral. And when you get to the common femoral, there's a flush occlusion of the SFA. The SFA pop are totally occluded. We go to the next view. The occlusion keep continuing. You go to the next view. Oops. Uh, and then you, we're looking at the tibial, and you see that there's not much flow. Can you play that right panel, please, quickly, if you don't mind? The right panel. If you can play that, yeah, if you can. So this is what we are seeing when we're injecting from the top. You see a little bit of a collateral flow coming down. It's really hard to make some things, but there is something there, apparently. So in this situation, we came down. First of all, we had some hard time getting the sheet over. So we did the anchor balloon in the profunda to be able to get the sheet over. So we got the sheet over, and we did the routine that all of us do. We tried to come integrate, and this was a live case. I was sweating. I was stressed out. Couldn't get across in the integrate. So we said, well, you know, maybe the problem is just getting through this area because of some scar tissue. And this patient had two prior FEMPOP bypasses. You can see the staples that had failed. And the endarterectomy. So three times folks had been in his groin. So we decided to get retrograde access in the pop. So this is what I mean. This is CTO. Uh, we are in the supine position. We can easily get access, pass the wire through, and we are able to do a reverse card and get through this. So we got through this, we got down, so now we are at the pop, and this is the Navi cross, and I'm trying to cross this calcified CTO here, and we couldn't get across this. So at this moment, we got a retrograde pedal access, and here's a forefront GR4. We couldn't get engaged because this was an occlusion. I couldn't get enough support and engagement to be able to come up the pop, so I decided to create a hole here on top of the GR4, kind of place the hump over into the TP trunk, and use the top of this to give me a good, you know, kind of reinforcement to be able to advance the stiff angled light wire up into the pop. And that's what we did here in this area. Now we are up there. Then we tried reverse card, this card, that card, all the different procedures that you're all familiar with. And we still couldn't get the two wires to meet and speak with each other. So we decided to do a facilitated reentry here. Did the facilitated reentry, was able to externalize the wire and just balloon angioplasty and DCB. And these were our results afterwards of the, the proximal SFA, the distal SFA pop into the AT, AT, and that was the dorsalis pedis in this patient. And this was the ABI afterwards. The last uh, case I'm gonna show you quickly, this was a 92-year-old gentleman with a uh, SFA pop occlusion. You can see ABI, this was a Rutherford 5 again, and this was the aorta. And it was a 92-year-old with calcification, subclavian, radial, this, like, I was like, there has got to be a way we can get this thing over so we can do this up and over technique. And if you have a stent in the leg that you're trying to treat, it's God's blessing. Because the safest place and the easiest place to put a sheet or to get access is in a stent. So in this situation, I was like, oh, this is exciting. I can get access into the stent. And again, same technique. A supine position, perpendicular, I-I, with the needle, with the stent. So all aligned, just like this. Everything is aligned, and we're able to get access. When you get access in these stents, when you pass the glide wire, you want to get this loop. And then you want to check in two views quickly, make sure that you're not behind the stent or under the strut. As, uh, once you do the, the two angles and you confirm that you are in the stent in this view, then you just push it up aggressively. You get to about here. Here is a good area to stop. Now you can take your needle out, put the navy cross behind it, shorten your loop so you don't extend maybe the section into the proximal area. And then in this situation, we now have a rail, and then we can go through anything. So here we are, we advance in the sheet, and we can then do our intervention. Thank you so much. Sorry we went over. I appreciate you all being here.
and it's sticking it out. Thank you.